I want to welcome everybody um, to um, this talk of Peace Week at George Mason University at the Carter School, the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution. This is an exciting time for us uh, because it's uh, a major anniversary of George Mason University's uh, existence um, of uh, 50 years. And it's uh, exciting because it's been a kind of uh, meteoric rise from being a community college not that long ago, uh, even when I first got here, uh, to becoming a major uh, uh, tier uh, university for research, and particularly the exciting way in which the uh, original school, the Institute for Conflict Analysis and Resolution, uh, was a major advance and developed and pioneered a field of conflict analysis and resolution that was purposely interdisciplinary, um, bringing in political scientists and sociologists and anthropologists um, and psychologists to work together. Uh, and the field has just expanded uh, and our school has just expanded dramatically since then. And uh, my, I came in uh, at a certain point uh, following the anthropology folks uh, with a specialty in religion and conflict resolution and philosophical ethics and conflict resolution. And that, that ties into very much what we're going to be having a chat about today. Today's format is that um, I'm Mark Gopin, and we're going to be discussing uh, the research that I have, um, the, the most recent research based on 20 to 30 years of experience uh, and the research has moved away from just only about religion to and philosophy and ethics to the deeper questions about the human mind. Uh, and the reason why uh, my research has moved towards the human mind is because the, the practice that I have engaged in for so many years since the 1980s has taught me a great deal about the the accomplishments and the limitations of what peace builders and change makers and basically those involved in creating the good society, the democratic society, um, the, the challenges that they face, the, um, the, 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 mind, the minefield that is placed in front of them in terms of what this work can do to you if, if your mind is not uh, more disciplined if you do not have in mind a kind of healing and a kind of approach to social change that is sustainable, not only for the people you work with, but for you um, as well. And so I decided to, in the last, really the last 20 years of the first, the book on conflict healing and the methodology I developed on healing and conflict. Uh, and now with this book is a deeper and deeper dive into biomedical issues and neuroscience issues in order to arrive at a better form of practice, at a better form of social change, not only uh, with implications, not only for peace builders who are a relatively small group of people on the planet, but really all change makers involved in trying to take very difficult and painful situations and make them something somewhat better all the way from emergency room doctors and nurses and social workers, uh, all the way to, um, to police and to uh, uh, anyone in dealing with emergency situations in which there is a tremendous assault on the mind and on the heart in terms of being able to continue to function uh, rationally and compassionately. So, with that, and, and then uh, I'm going to talk for a little bit, and then I'm going to call on my colleagues, uh, at least two of my colleagues here today, Professor Dan Rothbart and Professor Susan Allen, um, to respond with their own research and critique of some of the things that I've done in the book um, as it applies uh, to the world. And you'll see where their expertises fit into some of the things that I'm saying. And I'll be, I'll be dedicating my words today to some degree to have a, a fluid and creative interaction uh, with, um, with them as well. Um, if I see others who are colleagues today, I might call on them, but for now, I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, uh, 
I'm going to start just with the introduction and then uh, move on from there. So, and I'm also going to just share a screen. Let me just begin with with a uh, an overview of uh, of some of the things that you could look at while we're while we're speaking. Um, so basically, um, the the book is called Compassionate Reasoning: Changing the Mind to Change the World. Um, it's basically a combination of a study, in it, and and this goes along with the history of the school of going deeper and deeper and and broader into what we're learning from other fields as well in terms of a combination of ethics, neuroscience, and public health, and and actually combining that with the previous work that I've done on wisdom literature throughout the world, which often is referred to as religious literature, but it really is spiritual and wisdom literature and what it had to teach in terms of conflict analysis uh, and resolution. The book is um, divided into um, some very simple chap chapters introducing the necessity of this work uh, at this time, and then um, and then work on the mind itself, on the neuroscience relevant, on its application in public health, and then the applied ethics and habits of compassionate reasoning as they may uh, be practiced and put into um, future future expressions of uh, of our field and of our our projects. So uh, let me just. Um, launch into um, launch into uh, uh, the the um, let me just launch into this so um, basically one of the things that we <laughs> discovered is one of the things that we <laughs> discovered is that compassionate it, c compassion is one of the foremost pro-social values that are essential for human human relationships. And it's, been, it's become crucial in the way in which we, uh, like for example, the practices uh, I've been working for 18 years in, in, uh, in Syria and the last uh, 10 of those years have been working with refugees and with people in great, great distress. And the first and foremost, and I brought students into that work uh, first in terms of their understanding of what it was like to live in a police state and then the, the, the deep life of refugees, particularly women and children, and working and practicing with them and, and, and practicing the, the, our skills uh, and our ability to help and do service where we could. And what we know now, based on some of the neuroscience that is presented in the book, um, is that there are two, that, that pro-social emotions are critical to engaging in ethical behavior and engaging in peace building that is effective uh, because of the nature of its pro-social and ethical behavior. However, not all emotions are equal in terms of their effectiveness in sustainable work over time. And that it turns out that the brain has different pathways that have been demonstrated through Exp extensive experimentation, there's a different neural pathway for uh, em empathy versus compassion. And in the book, I define the differences between empathy and compassion in a very careful way. And even though in English, they are synonyms, but in tracing language and linguistics carefully in other parts of the world, these are distinct linguistic patterns that reflect the distinct neural pathways that we find. And that is that empathy is, is the natural and almost involuntary feeling of the pain of others, which is a human and animal quality that is um, very, very critical to pro-social behavior. And in fact, people who are sociopaths um, who don't know how to have that are very dangerous, as we know from history. And it's an essential quality. But compassion is a different quality because compassion is the joy and happiness and engagement in a pro-social way, in a loving way, and an eagerness to do service to the other. So compassion is an, ex is, is, is an imaginative 
um, joyous emotion that accompanies the practice of being engaged with people. Empathy is very different than that, and they can trace it through experimentation and through um, having people think over things and practice things over a period of a week, and they could trace where empathy goes in the brain and where compassion goes in the brain. And they can also trace at the same time the, the ability, the, um, the biomedical uh, expressions of this or effects of these two different emotions. And so empathy is referred to as empathic distress in the literature. And empathic distress over time uh, causes people to um, have an increased level of cortisol, an increased heart rate, an increased blood pressure, um, an exhaustion of the adrenal glands, ultimately social withdrawal, because it's overwhelming to feel that pain sustainably. Uh, it also uh, ties into anger, because the more the people around you are hurt that you're trying to help, the more that it, it reaches into anger. And anger, of course, is strongly situated in the amygdala. And the amygdala in the lower brainstem is a place of fight or flight. It's a place where either you engage in anger or you engage in, I have to get the heck out of here. And so that is what is popularly termed burnout. And burnout is an aspect of the field of peace building, but many fields that is at this point, the mental health involved in social change work or anything difficult in human engagement is completely underestimated by policymakers and by society in terms of its destructive impact on the person, but also the destructive impact on the nature and quality of their effectiveness at what they are uh, set out to do. And so therefore, um, we, we've uh, set upon an interest in how and, and whether uh, empathic distress, which is natural when you're engaged with people who are suffering, can it be retooled and, and, and trained in such a way that it moves towards compassion? Now, the other part of the book that's very different than what I just described, but is in the same book, is, is the question of reasoning and moral reasoning. And the reason why that's so important is because if and when we can motivate people to be compassionate actors and compassionately engaged, that's not the end of the story in terms of whether they can be effective. In the sense that there is no, there is no ne necessary relationship between compassion and the most compassionate person in the world, if they do not have reasoning that helps them to actually improve the situation of the people that they are engaged with. So that, for example, if somebody's lying in the hospital and they have a very complicated illness and they're slowly dying and the family is at, at each other's throats and the resident won't speak to the surgeon and, uh, and the nurses are being mistreated. And so they just come in and come out and they, and they, they don't really like their jobs. And the person running the machine um, that's keeping the person alive needs to take a break and he's never allowed to take a break. So he's pissed off. And you go on and on and on with why exactly this situation where everyone feels bad for the patient, they're all gonna, it's still, the, the patient's gonna die because there, the com, because compassion is defined as the joyous engagement with the other in a way that, that makes you want to use as much reasoning as possible to successfully move that person towards greater health, towards saving their lives at the very least. So reasoning is critical to the definition of compassion that I'm suggesting for peace building and for social change. Compassion without reasoning is, is, uh, is, is a good feeling and a good hope without any ability to actually serve. So the other part of the book explores the question of reasoning. And there are two ways to look at reasoning. One is, one are two cautions. One is that reasoning 
is a larger category than moral reasoning. And we have to acknowledge, and our whole field of conflict resolution acknowledges, that reasoning by itself is, is in the service of making the most efficient weapon systems, the most selfish capitalism possible, the most unjust arrangements, if reason suggests that that is the way that I can flourish, or, my, or I and my family can flourish, or I and my chosen group, or my, my chosen Harvard alums, how we can flourish in New York and in Washington. So reasoning would help us with a strategy for flourishing and to hell with everybody else. So reasoning by itself is not ethical. In fact, it's often anti-ethical in building the most efficient weapon systems conceivable. Uh, and, and then one day there's a nuclear war because nobody thought that all of the thousands and thousands of PhDs working on the efficiency of nuclear weapons would someday lead to genocide or omnicide. So reason is not uh, by itself a salvation, but reasoning together with moral reasoning gets you a little bit closer. But here's the rub and here's the problem with moral reasoning and with wisdom traditions. They're very contradictory. The implications of, and I go into this in detail in the books, the imp implications of, of deontology or Kantian ethics is, uh, is not necessarily in sync with a, a, a compassionate moral sense theory approach. And neither of them are terribly uh, wedded to consequentialism or the greatest happiness of the greatest number and utilitarianism. Because frankly, let's just take a brutal example. You have 10% of the population that's a minority in a country and, and you need to unify the country. And people come along and say, you know, the best way to unify us and stop fighting and stop killing each other and have a wonderful economy is to simply kill the other 10%. And that'll lead to the greatest happiness for the greatest number. So there are hidden weaknesses within moral reasoning theories that cry out for a combination if you're truly interested in peace and justice, if you're truly interested in peace building, if you're truly interested in the compassionate and good society. And that's why in the book I argue that basically we need systems of thinking and brainstorming and behaving. We need habits of thinking habits of feeling and habits of doing that create a exquisite combination of cultivating our compassionate capacity through service and through thought and through actions and through words. And then at the same time, negotiating and learning how to discuss our differences and debates through a combination of moral reasoning schools that helps the compassion move towards its hopeful conclusions. So again, coming back to the, the hospital bed and the patient who's dying, you, you, you have an atmosphere where everyone is motivated, not just by feeling bad for the person who's dying, but have an earnest, compassionate desire to see them saved and helped a little bit more every single day. And they know that that means that they have to develop exquisite forms of collaboration, cooperation, which with each and every person who's on the team in order for everyone to be able to problem solve all the problems that are going to come up, including an allergy emergency that threatens to kill the person within 10 hours, within five hours. And so suddenly everybody has to work together. And that means their skills of treatment of each other, of compassion for each other, of listening to each other, of reasoning together because brains are very, very attuned to thinking as fast as they can, the more people are actually listening and talking with each other, um, that creates much, much more intense uh, neocortex activity uh, in terms of problem solving. So that's why I moved towards this uh, subtle combination of trainings that would not only lead to better outcomes in terms of the compassionate society, but also lead to a change maker, whether that change maker is a police officer or a chief or a, um, a social worker or a pastor 
that that person would be in a better position to do this sustainably and joyously for the rest of their lives in order for this to be a model for children and young adults to say, hey, I want to do that. Because if we make a field where people understand just how much in pain we are, then nobody's going to want to do that, especially if the salaries are not very good. But if it's a meaningful life, it's, if it's a joyous life, then if, if, it's, if, it's a, if it's governed by positive psychology and mental health and physical health and meaningfulness following Viktor Frankl, for example, then the brain is integrated between all parts, the emotions, the cognitions, the reasoning, the habits, and the higher, the higher thinking and negotiations and debates all work together towards the goal of compassionate service. That is something that, would, that gives meaning to life in a way that from what we've seen in the text and the people we've studied, the compassionate meditators, is that that joyousness is practically speaking a much more sustainable model for um, the field of peace building and for the practice of, of, uh, of diplomacy negotiation and peace in the largest sense in terms of plans for society. Um, that's, that's a summation of the arguments of the book and some of the things that it, needed, it needs to explore, but the, the book goes into much greater detail about uh, all of these things. So I wanna um, stop there and call on, um, on, on uh, Dan, uh, Professor Dan Rothbart to critique this uh, and, and nuance it in the way, because Dan is uh, the resident expert at this school who pioneered philosophy and science. And this is about the, the, this, this complicated nexus of philosophy, science, um, even spiritual values um, and emotional values. And where, where uh, Dan, from his uh, many, many years of writing and practice, uh, where he sees, and then I'll call on doc, uh, Dr. Susan Allen there, uh, Susan Allen. So go ahead, Dan. Okay, thanks very much. Well, it's, it's always exciting, um, not only to be on the panel with you, but to, to read your books. Um, and, you know, I, I, I just gained so much from your many writings and um, just what's characteristic to me in, in, that I find exciting is you take experiences that seem to be ordinary you know, everyone has, most people have compassion for someone, for example, and then identify that as something absolutely critical for the field and for basically living in right relations with other, bringing into, bringing to bear, obviously, the latest insights from many of the disciplines, neuroscience, among, among others. Um, the other thing that I find exciting about your books. It's like it's like a barometer for the future of the field. I mean, if anyone wants to know where's the field going, read Mark's book. Um, but okay, so I'm just going to say a few words about the idea of change, and that to me is at the is the focal point. Change from negativity to positivity, to put it very vaguely, but more specifically, change from what I consider a common negative emotion, righteous rage, to um, positive compassion. And I'll mention some compassion is not positive. Um, I'll say why. So I see your book as a kind of revolution in the, the long-standing study of conflict transformation. Our field is all about transformation and to blend the research in with practice, obviously. Um, so just a few words about, about righteous rage. I just see righteous rage, and I'll, I'll mention compassion in a minute. I just see people raging righteously all over the place. I mean, it is just such a central 
mode of practice in the current political crisis in the United States. Um, it's not rare. Um, it, we, we see that with right-wing extremists. We see that with people who used to be moderates politically, they become enraged. Um, obviously there's layers of this and you know, the, the talk show folks and political leaders and, and so on. Um, it's, it's almost joyful. It's almost cathartic to rage righteously. So I find something that that, just to say a few words about that. So righteous rage, I think, involves three kinds of human processes. First is kind of a behavior that converges an individual with the group. So when an individual, you know, experiences rage, it's like that individual is part of the group. You know, I am enraged at the enemy. Uh, we can talk about right-wing extremists, even left-wing extremists. I'm enraged at the enemy. We are enraged at the enemy. There's kind of a convergence. The second thing righteous rage involves is a mechanism of emotional contagion. It is very, very contagious because people who are enraged, it's a great performance as a performance. You know, it's obviously antisocial or on the other hand, it's socially bonding at the same time for the in-group. So it's this kind of convergent of contagion to bring together followers, you know, potential followers, like-minded folks, bond together, of course, at the same time, demonizing the enemy. There, there's always an enemy that can be concocted. Um, by the way, an example of this is the Proud Boys. We did a research project on the Proud Boys and we found that they started with one enemy in 2016 and that was um, feminists actually. You know, they wanted to have traditional role of male superiority and then they kept expanding their list of enemies. Um, so, 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 the, so this second thing of rage is this contagion. The third thing that defines rage is kind of the symbolic meaning of, of righteousness. And righteousness obviously is this, you know, from narratives of moral superiority, from purity, at the same time, obviously stories about the horrible actions of, of enemies. Righteousness becomes self-righteousness. Um, and so all of this suggests a kind of identity formation. So with the, the right-wing extremists, in many cases, use rage for consolidating, for um, galvanizing their group, for increasing their, their uh, population, their activists. One thing interesting about righteous rage, it does correspond to parochial compassion because many times the right-wing extremists will exhibit superficial compassion, of course, to their in-group people who they claim are suffering. Um, so it, 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 they are obviously, in many cases, the warriors who are righteously protecting the vulnerable population. So there is this parochial compassion, um, but it lacks that kind of reasoning that Mark Open was just talking about, obviously, certainly hardly universal. So it's kind of a parochial compassion. All right, now, where's compassion fit in? Well, I am very struck by the challenge of breaking through this triplet. How do you break through this crystallized triplet of action, of the contagion, and of the symbolic meaning of righteousness? So I see that as really tight bond with extremists and a conflict protagonist. How do you break through that? And so the challenge in transformation, in conflict transformation, in my opinion, is to come up with finding out what procedures, what mechanisms, what kind of action, what can we do to break through? Okay, so the direction that I think is viable involves two kinds of processes. First, you know, this is not always exciting, but we have to do some tests, I'll listen to this. some pretests. We have to do some pretests, and 
already there are some very clear indications of what might work. Um, could I ask people to mute who, if you don't mind? Um, so there are some pretests. Uh, so excuse me, there have been some experiments that have been done to show how to promote compassion. Compassion is learnable. It's a skill. It is something that that almost any anybody has experienced, at least with their family, with loved ones. How do you promote that? And exper social scientists have shown that there are certain things to promote this. Meditation can promote this. This is kind of the action oriented, uh, obviously yoga. And there's a very interesting experiment by a neuroscientist, Emile Bruneau, late Emile Bruneau and his colleagues, who showed that compassion can be promoted among conflict actors by showing them the hypocrisy of their hatred. And what they have shown is that, and they've proven this in, as it were, a lab, so it's very artificial. Um, it's like a pretest. What they've shown is that when people are confronted, and they, they tested people who hate Muslims because of the you know, so-called terrorists, Muslim terrorists. So they hate all Muslims. So how do they get them not to hate all Muslims? So they show the participants that some Christians are also violent, commit acts of violence. And when confronted with this duality and a claim of hypocrisy, there was very clear indication of change. Okay, so that's obviously very carefully scripted and sculpted. So there are lots of reasons to think that people can be modified in their compassion. We can break through those crystallized triplets. What we need to do, of course, is to go outside of the lab and engage this in practice. What we need to do is to engage in uh, actually participatory action research, which my colleague, Professor Susan Allen is, is an expert in this. Um, participatory action research, basically to engage conflict participants in the capacity, not only to complexify the other, you know, have the vision of the other more complex. They're not all demons, to put it simply. Not only to do that, but to reflect on themselves, to reflect on their own assumptions. And the context, in my opinion, we are now in the conflict world at the very early stages where this should be applied. And that, what I mean is the conflict, the war in Ukraine right now has created the conditions, obviously, of righteous rage. Now we, from a moral standpoint, might say that Ukrainian civilians are justified in their righteous rage. It's totally understandable, of course. Um, we might say the Russian civilians, if they experience rage, maybe they're not. But we are in a situation where there is long-term uh, uh, conflict hostility that is now brewing. I'm talking about the long-term. And our field, I think, should be proactive in lowering the emotional intensity that is certainly at its peak right now um, to prevent cycles, which I fear, cycles of intense conflict and future wars. I'm talking about the future here. So this is a project, um, I'd love to see it come to fruition, um, but I think there's a need right there and I'm gonna stop there. Okay, um, I just want to, I'm going to turn to Susan uh, in a minute, but Susan, if you can indulge me to let, to respond a little to uh, Dan's wonderful comments. First of all, I, I, I just, I can't help but show that um, I, I, I keep on coming back to the imagery that we've seen, the neuroscience imagery, the, 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 um, the fMRIs that have been able to trace uh, the, the places that are light up, that, that are lit up with compassion uh, training versus empathy, uh, empathic distress training uh, versus complex reasoning, et cetera. 
and that really there's almost a battle in the brain between what is dominating. And my, my, my feeling about trying to help our field and the world understand righteous indignation and why there is a way to make a considered, careful, compassionate argument for defense, for a military taking up of arms. And there's no debating the, the human right to do that or the even ethics of doing that when people have decided to defend themselves. So this argument for compassion is not the same as an argument for pacifism. What it is, however, is a, a and the, what the concern is for with righteous rage and indignation is not the moral choice to be oppositional, because it, the moral choice to be oppositional against a bad policy, against a bad law, against an unjust situation, or against bombs coming on your family, that is a right, and some would argue in many religious and moral traditions, a duty. That's not the concern. The concern is that righteous rage means that your amygdala at the bottom of your brainstem is dictating everything that you do. It's dictating how you speak. It's dictating how you so-called rationalize. And, and, and believe me, when you really, I, I've, I've worked with hatred and with anger my whole life, and people who are, you would look at as enraged and hateful, really do have a logic to why they think that the only thing to do is to get rid of um, this group or get rid of that group. They have experience, they have generations, sometimes centuries, and they feel it's logical. The problem is, is that when they are enraged, they're, they're, it's the rage that's determining the way in which they think out complex problems. As opposed to, say, a village-based development person, lifelong committed to compassion, who comes to some pretty radical con con conclusions about how capitalism is destroying the villages in Pakistan or Bangladesh. And he shows systematically, this is the alternative. And one of the things you see in people whose anger is in control is that they always are future thinking and they're asking themselves questions about what would be the better alternative. Whereas when rage is dominating the discussion, there are no alternatives. There is no future, there's mainly rage, you know, and building on whatever rage is gonna accomplish. So I think what we're trying to do is drill down to the nature of how to discipline the mind to be, to be as subtle as we can in the service of compassionate and re, compassion and moral reasoning that leads to a better future. And it is the future orientation that's key to that kind of reasoning. It's not an argument for pacifism. It's not an argument for you never can fight or you never can struggle. It's an argument for how you do that and how you think about it. So I want to um, turn to Susan now uh, with your thoughts on this. Particularly, I'm going to just plan something, Susan. You're the expert on collaboration and on how people think together. And that's a particularly important aspect that people don't think that compassionate reasoning would be limited to me, myself, and I in the, in my, inside my own brain. Because that's the opposite of what you've seen in terms of where social change comes from. So Susan, please. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to, to be part of this conversation and uh, um, delve into your work more. And I really, I wanna comment on a few pieces and I will come to the collaboration um, part because you're right, that that's something that stood out for me. But um, I wanna start with the title. I wanna really appreciate compassionate reasoning, changing the mind to change the world. What you've done there is brought together the, the changing the mind part with the changing the world part. And you've said it's both and <laughs> that we're gonna do both. And we're not doing one just for the sake of it. And we're not gonna jump to try to do the other without working on the inside too. And so you've said it's, it's the inner work and the outer work that both matter. And then the compassionate reasoning, you've brought together the heart and the mind together and that both are intertwined. And, and so, I just feel like this then infuses the whole rest of the book, this um, holding the complexity, that it's not just a 
you know, quick do just exactly this exactly that way. It's the pull it all together. We need the heart and the mind. We need the compassion and the reason. We need to change the mind and change the world. Um, so one of the things that I felt um, felt I fell into years ago when I wrote about um, shifts in consciousness and that a, a lot of conflict resolution practice focuses on shifting consciousness. I was criticized with, well, but what about the real world? It's not just all in our heads. Yeah. And, and what I hadn't done is say the shifts in consciousness are reflected then in our actions in the real world. And they make a difference in how we engage in the real world. Um, and I had not made that explicit. Like the consciousness was in my title, but the actions were embedded in, you know, specific examples and so forth. So I really appreciate that, that right from the page one, um, that's really clear. I also appreciate that, um, that, you know, when I said about the working on shifts in consciousness, I was really focused on how do we work with parties in conflict and how do we help parties in conflict go from a um, focus on uh, demonizing the other to, oh, we have a shared problem and let's look at this problem together. Let's address this problem together. Let's realize we're all in the same boat, literally. We're all on the same planet and we've got the problem together and we're going to have to work it out. Um, that that shift in awareness of, of you know, the interconnectedness of people and that gets us to the collaboration part um, and the compassion uh, 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 part. But, but that, that, um, that what you've done is, is you've brought it to the, the very explicit, the, the inner and the outer is intricately connected. Um, the compassion focus, I love your emphasis, uh, clarifying empathy and compassion are different. And in general, in the US, we haven't learned the, the differences, um, but studying uh, Tibetan Buddhism, as I have for many years, there's a huge difference in there between the empathy and the compassion. And you bring this out really clearly in your book. Um, you, you have a lovely discussion of the practice of Tonglen and the transformation of, you, know, you have a description of the grandmother who's 97 and you love this woman so much and you see her in pain and just this, this you know, um, caring for the, the woman who's in pain and wanting to help her. <laughs> And it's just this, this beautiful love or the same way, you know, I guess, you know, you could write it also the same way of not the 97 year old, but the nine day old baby to, you know, when the baby's in pain, you just want to help. Um, and so that, that being able then to train ourselves in practicing that with everybody we meet, <laughs> um, even when we're dealing with um, uh, you know, very, very difficult people who are causing a lot of pain to others. Um, to be able to engage with a clear head. And that's where the reasoning comes in, is that when the heart is clear, the mind can be clear too. Um, and that both and approach that you bring, uh, I think is what makes effective practice. So, so I come to commenting on your book from a sense as a practitioner, what's, what's gonna work? And compassionate reasoning makes a lot of sense of what works in conflict resolution practice. I, um, I sat with my class, my uh, undergraduate class yesterday. They, we'd been looking, they'd done papers on reflecting on, on conflict resolution practice and, and their practice of conflict resolution practice. And everyone had been experimenting with facilitating a meeting and facilitating a dialogue and so forth. And in those um, papers, almost all of them mentioned listening as, as something that was significant to them. And so we did a practice of listening to each other in class um, and listening to ourselves. And just a moment, each person had one minute to speak and we all just listened deeply. Um, and that was different than just the theory of how conflict resolution practice. There's a practice of it too. And I felt like you know your compassionate reasoning makes sense of what the class was doing just for that moment was caring for each other and not with an empathy wide of, you know, one person speaking about, um, you know, so much going on in the semester and behind on assignments and so forth. We weren't taking on that stress, but we were hearing each other. And then we ended up with a very clear discussion in the class about, um, you know, moving forward and, and what we were going to be doing with uh, one of the group assignments that, that they had. Um, and it was the kind of the heart and the mind together, I think, that, that made that possible. So that's just a very minor example um, 
of of the way the practice the compassion practices that you describe uh they're powerful not just in big deal conflicts they're powerful in everyday work too um the uh developing cognitive and moral habits as as you put it and this training ourselves to think this way training ourselves not to go the empathy route where we're overwhelmed with with the emotions but to go the compassion route where we feel deeply and we're moved to do what we can to help but with boundaries and clarity of of um of uh what we can take on um i really appreciate the point of the question is the answer because i think we need to train ourselves with the compassion and the heart opening the heart in 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 a way that has clear boundaries but but is focused on on compassion and we need to train ourselves with thinking thinking questions that will be helpful because some questions are not helpful um and that i think we can practice both of those the um so the training to be effective practitioners um i applaud your bringing in this this whole concept of how do we train in our field, we need to bring compassionate reasoning into our training. Um, practice the listening, practice being present. And to, to respond a bit to Dan and the righteous rage comments, um, I feel like there's a way of, of really fierce, strong, compassionate reasoning um, and being driven, be, being um, nourished by and fed by that compassion the compassion in a way that shapes really clear action that may look radical that may look like you know whoa where'd that come from um but does not have to be driven by rage i think the strength can also come from compassion that can be a very strong motivator um uh and again going back to to some of the buddhist practices there where there can be um i don't think we've got someone not muted sorry um, there can be uh, really strong, um, con you know, uh, what was the phrase that you used, uh, Mark, you're talking about, you, know, you can take very strong, strong actions. It's not passivism. It's very, very strong action, um, but done with a clear head and a clear heart that is, is not clouded with, um, I feel like we don't think as well when we're under stress, right? And so that's something that, that, we doc doc that you've documented from the neuroscience of it. Um, and then finally, coming to the collaboration piece that, that you asked me to comment on. Yeah, the, um, we, when people come together to realize that they, and realize that they have some shared goals, they may have some different goals too, but, but some area of overlap, um, it, it opens up the possibility of thinking together. And like you were talking about, the, that we think better when someone else is listening. Um, we think better when we're in conversation uh, with with others, and so collaboration is um, strongest when we have what you're calling compassionate reasoning. We have a shared openness of um, understanding the pain others are in, and a shared motivation to alleviate that suffering. So when we talk about collaboration and coordination, I've never used the phrase compassionate reasoning with it before now, um, but people come together, they do a joint analysis of what's needed. They have some shared motivation, like from the heart level of why are we working on this? <laughs> and then they move um, to, from the, the joint analysis and the shared motivation to uh, what can any of us in the room do? And this sense of the network and that we're all interconnected and that some people are well-placed to do this sort of work and some people that sort of work, but how can that come together and support the, the change that's needed? Um, and then looking at, okay, how can we help everyone have the resources they need, the support they need to make all this work? And it ends up becoming um, the coordination and the collaboration emerge from independent actors who uh, voluntarily choose to um, subvert their own particular work to the group's overall efforts. And so their particular work makes a contribution in a certain way to the group's overall efforts. And they end up having this, you know, what I've called the shift in consciousness to their own work being seen in as a part of the whole, as opposed to as an individual thing. And so I think 
something that can come from this compassionate reasoning approach is in something that is um, effective in conflict resolution practice is the sense and awareness of the ways we're interconnected so that the actions of one affect the actions of others. Um, and that's not always apparent to us. You know, the same way we've grown up not knowing empathy and compassion are different things in, in the um, mainstream US society. I think we also have grown up not understanding action A has consequence B, which has consequence C, which is connected to the action A again, and that we end up in these cycles and these systems of interactive effects. Um, in an interconnection. So I think compassionate reasoning can help us. It's like you've given us one doorway in, the heart and the mind opening in for compassionate reasoning. And I think that's gonna lead to amazing places, Mark. <laughs> I think it's gonna lead to the understanding of interconnectedness um, and the ability to work together as people sharing concerns and sharing different kinds of strengths are going to be able to work together. The description, so touching the description of your time in um, in the intensive care unit where your sister was for many, many weeks very ill. And you've got this description of all these different medical workers working to keep your sister alive. Um, and you, you emphasize the um, compassion they had and how very effective they could be. They were not overwhelmed by the emergency of, you know, whatever oxygen levels or whatever it was that was, you know, very scary at different moments. Um, they were recognizing the emergency and then acting on it. Um, and I think the way you describe it, they were also acting together in a way <laughs> that the different expertise of the different medical professionals. And I think that's a really powerful um, example for our field to follow. We do have people with different expertise and different strengths to offer and different abilities and so forth. And, um, and compassionate reasoning can open us up to be able to see that, that no one of us is ever going to stop an entire war all by ourselves. That's just not how this world works. <laughs> but we can work with each other to do some really powerful things. So I'll, I'll pause there right. and I really appreciate the chance to be part of the conversation. Thank you. Great. Great. Uh, well, we'll continue, but I, I want to, I, your, your thoughts have really stimulated, um, uh, I, you know, I try to encapsulate everything with one new phrase, compassionate reasoning, but it really doesn't do justice to everything that I think we can move towards because it really, sometimes I call it in the book, a whole of mind experience or a whole of brain approach. And that, and that, the most redemptive and extraordinary things that people do that are nonviolent, that change society, that change history, are in the realm of, of a higher reasoning of the imagination. So the imagination is another key way to look at this. And consciousness is a good example of that. The very fact that you sit in a room with people and you engage in a process of what is our collective consciousness, there's an open-ended question it stimulates the neocortex to think in new ways. All prophecy, all poetry, all uh, many, many, many philosophical constructs of the future society, of the good society, they are all opening up consciousness to the future. And that's a whole different and very subtle part of the mind. And I, I'm not going to go into the pictures here, but where compassion plays best is in that part of the mind. It's all over the brain where compassion highlights, where it fires up. And it's all pretty distant from anger, rage, and fear, which are at the, we're at the brain step. So in many ways, what, what I'm proposing in the book is a whole of mind approach to how people change positively. I'll give you a couple of examples. One that I talk about in the book is music. So we know that music has an extraordinary effect on aligning brains when people listen to the same piece of music. Literally, their brain waves start to align. And I've had experiences, uh, my, my friends had experiences in North Africa when they brought together imams and rabbis from, who are extremely right-wing and conservative, and they brought them together from some peace-building processes in the Muslim and Middle Eastern world. And what was re remarkable, and this is, this is uh, I have to be careful with how I say it, but basically fundamentalist or conservative religion is not great on rational planning for a collective future. 
That's not the strength. It's usually futures that are exclusive or my group wins or some vision of the future that really doesn't include a whole bunch of people, um, uh, gay folks and all sorts of people, right? And, and then at the same time, the same people often have incredible skills of compassion and, and caring and service. And so the music in this one instance opened up a room where nobody was talking and nobody was talking in a way that was constructive. And the music transformed it so much because some of the imams and rabbis knew the same songs from childhood. And when they started seeing them together, it was like a Muslim song that the Jews knew and it, it's, they started crying. And so what I've said many times is that the moment groups start to cry, you're, you're halfway there, because that is a very powerful whole of mind transformation, because people come back after that and say, well, I, I, don't, I don't understand your worldview, but we have to try, you know, after they've, after they've eaten together, after they've cried together, after they've told stories together that moved them, and music was a key part of that. So what happened is that the brain opened up. It opened up to possibility, despite all of the barricades. And it's the same with many experiences with children. I write a lot in the book about mental maps, geographic mental maps that happen in the playground. And I'm particularly fascinated by alienation that leads to violent kids in America that leads to mass shootings. And so there's this thing called the buddy bench. And the buddy bench was thought of from a teacher, maybe in Canada. And basically, it was, the idea was that the teacher, with her authority, says that there's a bench in the playground where if you don't have anybody to play with, um, you, you sit in the bench and everyone has to keep an eye on the bench and they have to uh, bring you into their game. Sounds very simple. So they've instituted this lots and lots of places. It's fantastically successful. They, they color it, they paint it, it becomes a group or community project. And, I, and, and they, I saw kids being interviewed on video and I said, well, how long do you wait at the buddy bench? And, you know, with the history of alienation of kids and violence, I was thinking maybe a half hour, maybe it took them three days. And they, the kids said, oh, I, sometimes I'm there and it's 30 seconds, 30 seconds. And I asked myself how many of the kids who went on to become mass shooters, if there had been a buddy bench and they never were allowed to stew alone every day of their lives in school, eventually becoming such deep haters, totally isolated, empathically feeling their own suffering, and then learning video games and guns and so on, they never would have got there because the mental map of the universe was a universe in which there is a buddy bench. There is a place where you're never alone. So what I'm suggesting here is that it's way beyond compassion and reasoning. It's also a way for our field to get good at what transforms the mind in the, in the direction of, of love, care, or nonviolence. And that's a much more subtle thing. It includes much, which you tried to get at also with your concept of consciousness. Because we know that there are shifts in consciousness. The exciting thing is now we can see it and prove it with fMRIs. And the more, and, the, and I, the, the limitation I have, and Dan raised this, is that meditation for compassion definitely changes the brain. We've proven it. But I believe that actions and habits that it don't have electrodes attached, we don't have electrodes attached to when you hug somebody regularly, when you compliment somebody on a regular basis. We don't have electrodes attached to what transforms in the mind, but I have a strong sense that we're gonna get there with seeing the incredible impact of shifts in habits, behaviors, touch, feeling, music, compliments, honor, respect, all the things in traditional wisdom literature, we're gonna to start to see how it moves the mind in the direction of the future, in the direction of nonviolence, in the direction of hope. And then we're gonna integrate it more carefully into our training of peace builders. I'm looking for a radical revolution in training of peace builders. That's what I want. I want it to be revolutionary. I want it to be joyous. I want it to be sustainable. And I want it to be far more effective um, than we, we have been. 
and, and, and contagious. You know, Dan talked about contagion before, but what we know is that contagion runs in more than one direction. It can run towards hatred. It can also run towards love. It can run towards courage. Think of the Peace Corps and the millions of kids that were inspired at one point to join the Peace Corps in American history. Contagions are very, very much part of the, the mind experience that we're looking to, to create. Um, I want to open it up um, to questions and thoughts from some of the people here. So if anybody wants to turn on their camera and talk, uh, you're most welcome and mute your, unmute yourself. Uh, does anybody, um, anybody want to raise it? I don't know if you have raising of hand capacities. Does anybody have that? Yeah, folks can look at reaction and raise their hand. I see we have a comment in the discussion um, in the chat from Linda saying boundaries and clarity are so important as a healthcare professional it is also necessary. Ah, right. So Linda, would you like to elaborate on that? Is Linda still here? Yes, I'm here. Um, that was my career. Uh, I am a graduate of the Carter School. And I found that when patients are very, very scared going into surgery, it's really important that you show understanding for what they're going through without giving them false information or false hope. You don't tell someone that um, you're going to be fine, the surgery is going to go great. What you tell them is, I understand that this is very stressful for you. And I promise you that I will take very good care of you and I will be watching you and keeping you safe throughout the surgery. If I were to start crying with them, if it's a cancer surgery, um, I would lose my clarity of focus, which is to properly anesthetize them and take care of them. Um, but I believe that it's very important that in any field that we should pursue, that listening to someone is so important and showing that you're listening with your eye contact and your body language and perhaps taking their hand. And I found that worked very, very well for me in my career but it also kept me focused on what I had to do uh, to get this person through a safe surgery. All right, Lin Linda, that's excellent. I really appreciate that you're from that field. I, I more and more feel that as I studied the sciences and I realized that too much of our field is um, oriented towards hard sciences and not realizing that there's another kind of science and that's the science of medicine and care that is highly attuned to the patient in addition to simultaneously be attuned to the literature. In other words, this person and all of their uniqueness together with um, other people who are facing surgery, together with all of humanity, together with basic biochemistry that I have to know to some degree. That is our best model for what we're trying to do here as well. And Linda, brilliantly articulated something I, I, I tried to say in the book, and that is that, that, that her compassion was in being focused on her job and on the, the, the patient's needs emotionally and, and uh, not false promises, et cetera, not on feeling all the pain of the patient, because then she would start to dysfunction. And we all know that one way or another, many of us have dysfunctioned in complex conflicts. But the goal, the ideal is to channel, it's to see compassion as a form of reasoning almost. That compassion, that the, the new approach to the brain is certainly not Cartesian. It is that affect is thinking. Proper affect is conditioned by proper thinking about what our goals are, where we wanna bring this patient, 
Um, what do we have to negotiate in order to do that? What do we have to analyze in terms of the medicines? But also, what do we say and not say to bring the patient from point A to point B? To yes. triage, triage of safety, triage of better health, finally triage towards uh, full recovery and mental health. So that is a very disciplined approach to compassion that actually the best, um, the, I wouldn't I want to say the best, the most resilient people in healthcare are, are aware of. Just think of it this way. I started to realize that the emergency room is like, think of the doctor who comes in to the emergency room every day and says, if I have to hear one more person say, I don't want to live anymore because of this pain, I can't take it anymore. I'm just going to take some tranquilizers myself and get through my day. So that's one approach to empathic distress. But if the same doctor says, you know, every day there's somebody who says to me, they're so grateful that I saved their life. Or I, I, I you know, and I just can't wait to hear that from somebody today. I can't wait to do a kindness to somebody and, and, and feel that thank you when they touch my hand. You know, see, look at the way the brain is being trained by those two different doctors. And then you'll understand not only burnout but you'll, and resilience, but you'll understand, in my opinion, how we need, we need to do social change better based on that, those two different visions. Um, Kristen. Hi, Dr. Gopin. It was a pleasure listening to you talk about your book today. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit about, uh, so, you know, the downsides of empathy, how draining and difficult it is, are, are well documented, and you explained that obviously brilliantly today. But um, I wonder if you could explain a little bit if empathy has a a role in kind of the um, the entrance into compassion or into perspective taking or how we invite people into that place um, where they're willing to turn towards suffering when they're conditioned for whatever reason, uh, whatever their personal constraints are to turn away from it or to, to not engage. How right. do you get people to cross the threshold, I guess, is my question. Right. Well, that's one of the, the you know, what the, we have, a, we have a multiple uh, challenges when it comes to empathy and compassion in, in human society. It's very clear, and Dalai, the Dalai Lama pioneered a lot of this work, even at the scientific level, uh, in the last 40 years with Stanford and with others, and, he, and his books have been remarkable at this. What I started to feel, and I, and I met him on a panel, well, I was on a panel with him in 96, and I deeply influenced by his model in life, but I also started to feel that there are millions of people who need more empathy. But then there are millions who have too much and it's debilitating them to be compassionate caregivers and social change makers. So we need to honor that distinction that when we meet people, there are people who clearly need to feel the pain of the other in ways that they are not currently. And there are others who are feeling it too much and not becoming practical or it's causing them social withdrawal, which is an anger, which is, what we, uh, which is what the lab experiments predicted. So I think that the, the way to do that is to say empathy, the, and, then, and then there's also an, a third group, and I fit into that, and that is people who suffer from empathic distress. In other words, since I was born, it's an involuntary response to other people's conditions around me that I did not intend to do. It's, it's so bad that I even hear about a pain somewhere in somebody's body and I feel it you know, involuntarily, I get sick from it. You know, so it's, it's, there are people around running around like that as well. And I feel that in the caring professions, that group is overrepresented, that they, they, they went into it to sort of do something positive with their feeling bad for people but it's, it's, it's dicey. And if you're aware that that is there, you can, this is why self-examination is key in my books and it's key in the history of ethics is self-care, self-examination, self-knowledge, all the way back to the Delphic Oracle. It's the foundations of philosophy is knowing yourself. So if you come to know yourself and know that you're having too much, then you better start training your mind towards, well, what am I really doing for people? And what are my hopes? And what are my gratitude every day? But if you don't feel enough, if you're enraged at a certain group of people, 
you can do practices of empathic distress with that group. So that, for example, Dan raised the danger right now we face with Ukraine, Russia. So I'm doing a deep dive in my own way. I do, I do, I, I engage in conflicts in very uh, bizarre ways. And one of them is that I'm interested in the hermeneutics of religious traditions and their effect on the brain. And so I brought together an Orthodox Christian, brilliant theologian who's now a, a fellow at my center, uh, the Center for World Religions, Diplomacy and Conflict Resolution. I brought him together with other fellows on a strategy of messaging Russian people with a way in which they can make better decisions than Putin on treatment and attitude to Ukrainians and, and working through orthodoxy to do that. And there's just amazing ways in which you can affect the mind through something that's familiar to you and meaningful, okay? But there's a whole bunch of other people out there who are only feeling the pain of Ukrainians with nothing to do. And it just makes them angrier and angrier. And then they say, well, you know, Maybe we should risk nuclear war. You know, people are, you know, in the name of compassion, they're, they're saying maybe we should go head toe to toe on nuclear because this is unacceptable. They're really not thinking through 7 billion people burning up because they're so upset about, you know, the, the hundreds of thousands who are suffering now and the millions who are on the move. I've been through this with Syria. It's the same thing. I've been through this in many wars. And so the mind needs empath, empathy, but it also needs limitations on it to channel it towards hope, rationality, and compassion. We can train in that. And that's, that's where I, I think we, we, we have to know ourselves well and help trainings help people to know themselves better. Um, just want to pause for other other thoughts. Uh, Susan, do you want to come back on that? Or no, Doug? no, I'm fine. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, a couple of things that I didn't mention before that I just want to um, emphasize in terms of of possible practices that emerge from this is that there is. Um, there is something that I go into in the book that you, some of you may be familiar with, and that's the, the peace corner or the mediation corner of kindergartens. And I want to emphasize once again that what happens in, in the mental map that is being developed in five-year-olds is fundamental to where they're going to be in 10 years in terms of peace and violence. And, and that idea that there is a safe space that authority figures have determined is part of their mental and geographic universe is going to create habits of a lifetime in terms of where the mind goes when there is distress and when there is conflict and that there is a corner uh, of refuge. I wanna point out that what I'm learning from the field, I mean, it was one of the things that certainly Westerners have to get used to, there is genius going on all over the world of people who in every culture who are experimenting with this shifting of the mind. The first time I ever heard of a peace corner was actually in Damascus from kindergarten teachers in Damascus. And you know, you understand now 500,000, 600,000 dead later, half the country out of their homes, you know, there's a tendency in our brain to stereotype and generalize like we don't have anything to learn from from, uh, from Syrian kindergartens. Well, that couldn't be further from the truth. Everyone is a source of learning. And in that moment, in that Syrian kindergarten, when they set up this idea that there is a space for dialogue, for listening, for apology, for forgiveness, that you yourselves have the power to do at the age of five, it's revolutionary. Well, the one person the one family that left in protest of that corner from the kindergarten in Damascus later went on to orchestrate the genocide. And they left saying, we don't apologize to anyone. And so my Syrian friends were very disturbed by that. I actually was hopeful because I said to myself, well, when it comes to war, there aren't too many winners. 
everybody suffers and people with guns are very good at using them. But on that day, that kindergarten teacher won. She created an atmosphere where the dominant structure and all those kids that she raised had the idea of a peace corner. And so it wasn't enough to stop the structural conflicts, the structural, the proxy warfare of the West and Saudi and Qatar versus Russia, you know, that caused this conflagration, but it was enough to have a deep effect on a lot of Syrians who tried uh, very hard to create a nonviolent shift to democracy in those critical years of 2010, 2011. And we have to honor them, even if history was not on their side at that moment. We can never forget that. Um, I'd like, just like to open up to any other comments and thoughts from people in the audience. You can unmute yourself. Because you all have wisdom here. Well, Mark, I have a question if others aren't ready to jump in. Please. <laughs> so the... Um, you know, so many profound implications for how we teach conflict resolution and how we teach people to do conflict resolution practice. Um, what's next in terms of revolutionizing our curriculum, in terms of peace education in kindergartens, in terms of, and I feel like it's, it's so far beyond the bachelor's, master's certificates, PhDs we offer. It's the kindergartners, it's, yeah all over. So what do you see as next steps for you and for our field as a whole? Well, I would like to see, um, I would, I, I mean, first of all, I'm, I don't want to do anything uh, on my own, but I would like to see us all together think more carefully about a field-based approach to learning together with a deep study of texts and traditions from conflict resolution theory to, to psych um, to philosophy, to ethics. I do think ethics is deeply underrepresented. In other words, when you study the range of ethical theory, you start to realize why people fight. There's the, because ethics has very different results based on the school and the emphasis you have on principles versus outcomes, et cetera. And I, uh, part of the goal of the, of the book was to get people to agree to disagree in nonviolent ways through understanding and respecting the different conclusions they're coming to rather than righteous rage. And we have not done enough training in that. We have not done enough soul searching as a faculty. I'd like to, faculties, I, I'd like faculties to talk together about their serious differences and working them out in the compassionate and reasoning way that we're talking about and then model that for the field. Then, I really like to see most of the work begin with carefully guided field work where people come back from the field and they say, whoa, I was not prepared that in the middle of the war, there is this um, trans kid that is uh, enraged and he's the one that they, the, the, the help group in this particular place, this, the, this, this, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of a war and I'm in the middle of this place caring for traumatized kids. And the case that they have the hardest with is, is a trans kid who's lost his identity or, or, or simply is just angry all the time. And it's a very religious staff and I'm just blown away. I thought religion was the opposite and they're doing brilliant things with this trans kid and helping him through the trauma of war. And I, or them through the trauma of war. And you know, and it just rocked my world. And now I don't, I, I have to rethink things. Or the person who comes back from the field and says, I, this is the first time in my life that I've seen victims of weapons that I actually helped produce. And I, 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 it's changed my, I don't know what to do with that. So I think that it's almost a therapeutic apprenticeship and learning process that would bring us in a better place to have all of our students become authors of new approaches. That the creativity is there, but where we, we have to mentor it in a, in, a more, in a more fluid counseling way that, that they, they read, we read, but they experience, we experience, and then we, we help people develop their own 
pathway. You know, because because the needs of the world are so great that we need a thousand students doing a thousand different interventions, each with their own creative pathway. But right now, what we have is a big bifurcation between study and the field. And there's a, a lot of trauma once people get out there and and the theories don't match because honestly, they have to build their own and we, we can help them. So I'd like to see a training process more in the realm of apprenticeship. Uh, and, that, and then for example, like somebody says in the middle of uh, the war, he's like, but you know, everybody's talking, they, they want jobs in the refugee camp. I don't know what to do. It's like, oh, interesting. You know, and, and the one who did get a job, their, their life was changed. So what do we, what, what do, we do? ah, well, we need to consult with people in the economics of refugee camps. And we need to consult with people on, uh, on empowerment on the ground in terms of employment in radical situations. Are there experts like that? Let's go to them together, you know? And then, and then let's reflect on the conflict resolution challenges of doing that in, you know, in, Dema in, in, in uh, Amman you know, in a refugee camp in Amman. And that, that, that way, what you do is you become part of a problem-solving approach, but with deep compassion and respect for the place that they're coming from. And then the student doesn't have to be convinced of how consequential all of this is. They're already in it. That, that's the way I would like to see it, you know, evolve. I see there's some comments. Um, uh, Linda says, I'd like to see more work done on the relationship between anger and blood sugar levels. When blood sugar is low, there is perceptible change in behavior. Yeah, don't I know it? <laughs> so um, that, that, that happens. It's very common with a lot of people. And I think that that would be an interesting, I mean, I have to tell you just how many different peace processes that I've seen remarkably shift because of shared meals. And we've done, we've done that. We, we, uh, you know, we just, you know, it, it, it was very complicated in, uh, in the Middle East with groups that are minorities and they're not accepted. I think you've heard of the Yazidi and the horrific treatment that women received at the hands of the ISIS uh, and the horrible mass rapes. Um, and we're, we're sitting now, we, you know, we, we've had some meals because we thought that we have to figure out a way for traditional Muslims and Christians to sit with Yazidi and talk together now that they're all in the same boat of vulnerability. And, and it's been working out brilliantly, but it's all around food. It's all around sharing. And so we should study that more because maybe that should be a preeminent conflict resolution practice, not just something you do on the side, but something that do, is done with great care and love and, and contribution, which is different than just having a conference and having a caterer take care of the food. You know, it's a very different experience, very different investment, uh, ethically speaking, emotionally speaking. So, so let's study that. Um, so that's a, that's a, you know, a good comment. Okay. And Mark, I don't think I've told you that when I first brought Georgians and South Ossetians to point of view, we had some catered meals. And then they pulled me aside and said, can we make dinner tomorrow? <laughs> and we went to yeah. the grocery store and they did. They took over the kitchen there and they made a lovely meal. Um, and that really brought the group together. It was transformative. Yeah. Yeah. One of my earliest experiences in the 90s was being at a, this retreat center in, 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 in uh, Switzerland that was run in a very proper Swiss way with very precise kinds of food and times for eating. and and uh, I was there and a whole bunch of Middle Easterners were there. And, and I, well, I was Jewish and they were, um, some were Palestinian, some were Lebanese. And um, we bonded on how much we couldn't stand that supper ended at seven o'clock. And so we raided the kitchen together, literally, because I, there was a kosher kitchen and we, we literally found ways. And that was the bonding empowering experience. That led us because when you when when people can take over their own food and this is true in refugee camp one of the reasons why these camps are so problematic is that it takes away all agency and so anything you can do to bring moral agency even at point of view 
they're still out of their comfort zone in a vulnerable space. And, and, and that gave them agency. And we all need that. You know, we, we all need that. So this is, this is the kind of out of the box thinking that I think that with the science of the mind, we're going to feel more courageous and more confident that we're not just doing pie in the sky, hippie stuff, that this is a different approach to the whole of the mind and how people transform uh, their relationships. And I think it's very exciting to be at that stage when we can watch the mind at work, when we can have access to so many different amazing experiments and then, and then move towards uh, more and more experimental practice. So, okay, so that's great. Uh, thank you all. This has been a wonderful experience. And um, um, congratulations to George Mason on their graduate on, on its uh, on its anniversary, and to the Carter School for this wonderful effort to uh, bring us all together to talk. Um, uh, okay, so blessings to everybody. Bye bye.